We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Good morning and welcome to Friday's edition of Free Association Radio. This is Robert Phoenix. You're listening to the Friday Farcast. And the Friday Farcast is a little bit different than the other two shows that we do here two times a week. It's generally based around interviews and talking with people and going as far and deep as possible into their work within the limited amount of time we have set aside for such forays. And today is the first Friday of every month. And uh, or it was the first Friday of this month. Uh, and on the first Friday, we are always joined by the lovely Sarah Nash for 30 minutes of scintillating conversation and cosmic gossip. Uh, after Sarah, we'll be bringing on Shona Home, a really interesting woman uh, and writer and shaman and explorer of plant medicine. She has a new book out called Love and Spirit Medicine. We'll be talking with her about her book and about her work in general. And then finally, in the third hour, we'll be joined by my good friend, Kenneth Warren, who is an amazing scholar and poet and metacritical thinker. And he just came back from the uh, Vincent Farini event in Gloucester. And uh, it's a, an event that's held to honor Vincent Farini, a great American poet, and one that not a lot of people know about. So we're going to talk about Farini with Kenneth and why he's important. And I think Kenneth might even read a poem or two of Farini's. It's going to be a great show and it's going to be wall to wall uh, information and entertainment and general joviality and wisdom all combined. So let's not waste any more time and let's bring on yours truly, Miss Sarah Nash, a.k.a. The Cosmic Hooker. Howdy. Hello. Hey, Sarah. What's up? What's up? What's up? Oh, I'm just... Keep calm. You know, Don't panic. I'm good. I'm all good. <laughs> I'm fine. You sound very, very mellow. You sound incredibly mellow. You didn't smoke anything before you got on the air, did you? You sound too mellow. What's going on? No, I did drink a ginseng up cola, though. Oh, uh, okay. All yeah, right. exactly pretty tasty. I'm just going to describe this drink for you. It's called a Caribbean favorite. I don't know why it's called a Caribbean favorite. The root of all power. Ginseng up. Cola with a K. Champagne. Hey. Uh-huh. So uh, that should be kicking in here anytime soon or shortly. So uh, when that occurs, I can't, I can't uh, take responsibility before it comes out of my mouth. I am already all over brain chemistry these days because I quit smoking, and um, you know, which is I, it's it's time, it's time. I, this is like the eighth or ninth time I've I've, you know, quit quitting or tried to quit quitting or something. I don't know, but uh, right. this is this is the first time I've ever gone cold turkey 
And uh, I'm using Charles Gant, Dr. Charles Gant's uh, brain chemistry um, uh, information with regard to that. So I'm taking all these amazing amino acids and lecithin and taurine and L-tyrosine. And so I've got this huge um, program of all these different natural elements because as essentially uh, cigarettes reprogram your brain. Mm -hmm. I never gave anybody permission to do that, damn it. Uh huh. Well, you did, I think, when you when you laid your 875 or whatever it is now down for that pack of uh, pack of smokes. Yeah. No. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. And um, I mean, subjectively, yeah, it was stupid. But I was 18, and uh, now I understand a heck of a lot more about brain chemistry mm -hmm. than I than actually than I ever wanted to, and it's it's phenomenal stuff. But no, if I had known, it's sort of like speed. It's like a lot of people say, you know, if I'd known that I was going to lose my teeth, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done speed. And here's the thing: if I'd known that they were actually going to reprogram my brain, then right. I, uh, I would not have done certain things. But you know, it is what it is. I didn't smoke when I was pregnant. I didn't smoke when I nursed my children. But the minute that I had my children away from me and they were no longer dependent on me for nutrition. Um, I started smoking again, and I, it's just, it's vile, vile stuff, but oh my god, I love doing it, oh, but yeah, gotta go, gotta go, can't do it anymore. So what, what, what brand were you smoking, your most recent brand? Um, well, I, I got hooked on Parliaments for years. Parliament? Loved them. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. loved them. Uh-huh. Every other cigarette I ever smoked tasted like crap to me, and somebody said it was because Parliament's had a a, a carbon filter or something. I don't know. It's just, uh, I don't know. I tried American Spirits, and they just tasted really nasty to me. And For years and years and years, I used to roll my own. And, uh, in fact, a lot of pictures that I have of me as a very young adult, even um, they, they, it looks like I'm holding a joint. My daughter was looking at them, and she'd be saying, "Oh, Mom, were you smoking pot? You're such a hypocrite. You hate pot." And I'm like, "Oh no, it's tobacco." <laughs> well, yeah, uh, I could see that. Uh, you know, what's interesting is that they have had a similar type of treatment or course of action for treatment around alcoholism, and when people go cold turkey with alcohol, there, there is a series of protocols where there's a massive infusion of B vitamins and amino acids and all these other really high-powered, um, you know, minerals and, and vitamins and all kinds of goodies so that the body does not fall over a brain chemical chasm. So I think that exactly. that's probably what's going on with you, right? Well, no, actually, my mentor, Kathy Lynn Douglas, um, she is the one who, when I told her that I was actually going to go cold turkey, which is something I've never done before, um, I've, I've done the patch, I've done lots and lots of different things, and um, she said, listen, you, what you really need to do is, is you need to, um, you know, take some lecithin and uh, tyrosine and um, some 5-HTP, because and then she she came, she gave me the rundown of why, and this is a woman who is who is um, she knows more about brain chemistry than the average physician's assistant. I mean, it's it's she's a pretty phenomenal human being. But anyways, so yeah, she gave me the lowdown. I read Charles Gant's book, End Your Addiction Now. It made a lot of sense to me. This is a man who's who understands why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't make me feel like I was just the stupidest person on the planet for doing something that, you know, um, causes a slow suicide. But, hey, Robert, this is the thing. I think they're allowing this stuff to happen because I believe it's population control. Uh, I think they're, they're allowing people to, to drink and that. to smoke because yeah. they are controlling the amount of this is this is sort of like the the National Institute of Health or or something. This is their way of saying, okay, if these stupid people are going to go ahead and do this, 
55,000 people die every day as a result of cigarette smoke. But, but here's, here's, here's where I get kind of wrapped around the axle with that. And I agree with you. But if that was the case, then why not make cigarettes a whole lot cheaper? I mean, if they really wanted to take out a bunch of people, cut them in half, and you'll, ha and you'll have – it'll be cheaper, have more access to cigarettes, and therefore your mortality rate will be higher. So I agree with you. But on the other hand, it is cost prohibitive in some ways. And then you begin to look at, like, well, who's on the boards – of these tobacco companies. Well, I'm sure it's a lot of the same people that are on the boards of petroleum companies and uh, pharmaceutical companies. So they're profiting, you know, all across the board with a lot of these businesses. So they're engaged. And a lot of these people, I'm sure, are, you know, part of the population reduction program too, because at some point they just don't want to share the planet with the rest of us. So I'm just, I, I'm trying to work out the, the, the algebra around cigarettes because there's a yes factor and then there's also a prohibition factor that converge at the same time. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think if you're going to try and work out the math around it, you have to understand that I mean, have you ever smoked? You know what? I'm going to tell I'm going to tell you right now. I did not smoke when I was a kid. My father told me that if you ever caught me smoking, he'd twist my arms off, and my father was a big enough guy with enough of an edge that when he said it, I believed it. So it uh -huh. took me 37 years of my life before I started smoking. And so from the age of 37 to about 41, I smoked. I did not smoke consistently. I was very picky about the type of cigarettes I smoked. I was a cigarette snob. All I smoked was pretty much Sherman's or American Spirits. And the thing that I could always do on a, I could the thing that I could always do on a dime is I could quit. I did, if I didn't want to smoke anymore. It wasn't a problem to me. So I'm not sure if it's because I didn't start when I was an adolescent where the brain is still forming and you get these high-impact uh, nicotine uh, uh, agents in the brain and all the other stuff they put in there to hook you. That didn't get me. So by the time I was 37, it, it didn't seem like I, – I, I, for me, Sarah, I don't understand the conflict with quitting a cigarette because it's not a problem for me. Now – there may be some issues for me with other stuff, but but not that. So, to, to answer your question, yes, I did smoke. Okay, but but it wasn't. Um, yeah, I there. You're a rare breed. You really are. You're a rare. I had a few friends in the past who would only smoke when they went out drinking, and I would look at them and they would say, "Oh, yeah, you know, um, I went out a couple of nights ago and I had a couple of cigarettes and." And the bottom line, though, is that it's it it is a highly it is highly addicting, especially yeah. for women. And and I've heard more men say, "Yeah, I can quit whenever I want to," and they do. So I think that some research needs to be done on that. Dr. Gant didn't talk about that. Um, but here's the thing: I'm in day two. I'm working on you know 48 hours of of no nicotine in my system. One of the reasons I decided to go cold turkey was because I, I know that it's the nicotine. I know that I'm addicted to the nicotine. The other stuff I can handle, man, I chew on toothpicks all day long, even mm -hmm. when I'm not smoking. I, I have toothpicks. I'm, I'm really <laughs> – I I'm orally fixated. Yeah, it's just uh, – it, it, here's the thing. It's It's got to go. I – the most important thing is I do not want my grandchildren to see me with a cigarette ever. It just terrifies me. My kids watched me smoke. My daughter thinks it's okay to smoke, and she's smoking, and she's so beautiful, and I wish she didn't. My boys can't stand it, so they're not. But um, I'm, you know, here, here, can you see me, like, going out and, and doing these conferences and these workshops and, oh, by the way, take a, I got, I got to take 10 minutes and run around the corner. I got to smoke. I'm a role model. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have a lot of issues around that. I mean, I mean we, we get so hung up on how people should look and appear in our culture. You know, I don't, to me, look, as long as you were congruent with what you were talking about and we're sharing really high-level information. I, I, your smoking would not bother me. Now, it may bother other people, but it wouldn't bother me. You know, and, and that's interesting, too, because um, 
a friend of mine is firmly convinced that people who are bothered by cigarette smoke and tobacco are probably not to be trusted. And and I wish I could say his name on the air because if if it, <laughs> he sat back and he said to me one afternoon, he said, "Yeah, people who have problems with smoking and tobacco are are evil." <laughs> Well, I, I actually, I've got a funny cigarette story that happened in the last uh, 48 hours. You want to hear it? Yeah. All right. So I came home the other night, and uh, I, I had stopped at uh, the local restaurant. It's a place called Jack Allen's. They have the most potent frozen margaritas on the planet. And uh, it was a very hot day, so I had a couple of frozen margaritas. And I uh, came home and, and uh, decided to knock on the door from uh, the, of the apartment downstairs because I heard all this rumbling. It was it was kind of annoying. And I remembered at one point um, I had my son and his friend over and they were racing little remote control cars on the floor. Not a big deal, but the people downstairs started banging on the ceiling. So I you know I had a couple of margaritas, so I wanted to find out you know, what their what their thing was all about, right? So I knock, uh-huh. door, I knock on the door, and this woman answers the door. She lives down there, and uh, she's probably, I don't know, maybe late 20s or 30s. We start talking, and I ask her about the noise. So then she starts talking about the apartment next door, and, and, and I look at the door, and there's all these massive dents on the apartment next door, on their door. The cops were there the other night. These are the people with the dogs. They're all, they're crazy. Uh-huh. They're just totally crazy, insane people. And she says, well, I think that that's what it was. And then all of a sudden, the women who live across from her, they came out of their door, and then the woman next door came out of her door, and we all started talking about the people across the hall. And, in fact, the two women, they had somebody try to break in to their apartment, thinking that it might have been them. So we're having this kind of major meeting kind of on the, on, on, on the deck there, on the, uh, on the landing. And then I look at the woman who lives below me, and I said, you smoke? You smoke, don't you? <laughs> and she said, she says, yes, I do. I said, oh. I said, so what do you smoke? And she says, camels. I said, oh. And I said, I used to, uh, I said, when I smoke, I smoke Sherman. I said, they have a really good taste. And she's looking at me, and she says, why, thank you. And I'm like, what, what just happened here? She thought I said, you have a really good face. And <laughs> It was, just, it was the strangest moment, I mean, and because the way she was looking at me was, it was not like somebody who just said, hey, I really like the taste of that cigarette. It was a very odd moment, I'm like, okay, well, this is interesting. I think it's time for me to go upstairs now and try to sort all this out. Yeah. So, uh, I, there you go. There's just a strange little cigarette, you know, anecdote. Uh, but it is I very, love it. It was, it was the thing I like about cigarettes, okay, is I like to have them when I go out and drink every now and then, just like your friend said. And, and, and there's something about especially in California, because here in Texas, you can smoke just about anywhere. I mean, it's not like California. In California, you've got to be like 100 feet from a door or something. You know, it's really a, a big deal. But the thing is, right, it's like in California, when you're outside and you're smoking a cigarette, now all of a sudden you're bonding with other people, and you're bonding in kind of a unique way, right? All of a sudden you're outsiders. Literally, you're outside. You're outside of the establishment, you know, and because of how heavy it is in California with cigarette smoking, you're now you're a double outsider. So now you're now all of a sudden you've got all the you know this kind of instant access into each other's lives in some ways. You pre-qualified in that moment, and that's when this interesting bonding can take place. And that's the other thing I like about cigarettes because it's, you go into a bar, it's loud, noisy, but you go outside, it's very kind of intense, one-on-one, yet very casual relating with somebody who in that moment is just as much of an outsider as you are. You know, and that's funny because in Washington and Seattle, when my daughter and I would go out, there were a couple of times, in fact, right after the um, Alanis Morissette concert, <laughs> at the Moore Theater. There's this really old, very famous bar, and my daughter and and my husband and I, we went out, and uh, <laughs> I started giving people readings outside. I started doing sessions with people 
I, I don't know. I don't, there was something about the alcohol and then, of course, the brain chemistry. I'm a little worried what's going to happen with my brain chemistry with regard to stopping an element that has been a part of my life for so long. And it'll be really interesting to see if, um, you know, if, if my clairvoyance and my intuition become stronger, which I hope it does, or if nothing changes at all. Because i got to tell you, when I get really, really drunk or when I start having a little bit too much of, of something, I'm immediately joined by Jack Kerouac. And, uh, but it, that's a different story for a different day. So I'm standing outside, There's and I see this that, woman. I can't let that stop. So when you, are, when you are in an altered state, the spirit of Jack Kerouac joins you. This is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, like uh, not all the time. I, mean, I know I said all the time, but it does happen, I would say, five times out of ten. Okay. It's there, and we're, we're clear, and it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I've, I've actually written quite a bit about it that I should probably publish someday. But, um, and, of course, I lived where he, he lived in, in Big Sur at Lopez Point. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I did not know that. I did not know that at that time. But... So I'm in Washington, I'm in Seattle, I'm at this bar, I'm going outside to smoke with my daughter, there's people out there, and of course you have that, that immediate intimacy, and um, I see this woman, and she looks very strange, and, and in my altered state, I realize that she's dead, but she's hanging out with this guy, and she sees that I see her, and she goes, she points to him, and I can't really hear her, and I'm like, and so I'm like stumbling over him. <laughs> And, um, and, she, and so I hear her when I get closer to him. It's very strange. And she goes, I need for you to tell him that I'm okay. And I'm like, hey. And I grab him by his shoulders, and he's looking at me, and he's like, what? And I'm like, your girlfriend or this woman, this beautiful woman, wants you to know that she's okay. And <laughs> I would never do, never, not in a million years. And he looks at me, and he goes, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, everything's fine, she just, she's so tired of you being so sad, and I'm like looking at her, and she's like mouthing the words and pointing at him, so it suddenly now, because I can't hear her, I can just see her really well, it's becoming charades, and it's actually very funny to me, because I'm drunk, because right. I'm outside, and so I'm like, hold on a second, and I'm like trying to interpret what she's saying, and this guy is looking at me absolutely horrified, but then he realizes, and he goes, are you a psychic? And I'm like, yes, yes. And my daughter's like, oh, my God, Mom, come on. I'm like, no, no. And it was absolutely wonderful. And this happens, you know, when you go outside, when you're smoking, and you have this intimate moment. And, yeah, I get it. I don't want that to change. Well, I really don't want that to change. I loved smoking. It was it was part of my personality. It was part of who I am and was and but, it, I, you know, here's the thing. I don't want to get bladder cancer. Did you know that, like, 86% of women who smoke for over a certain amount of time will get bladder cancer? I was not aware of that. Nope. Yeah. The statistics are huge. They don't tell you that. And it's my, grand, my, my grandbabies. They are so beautiful. I'm a gilf, you know, and I want to stay that way. I don't want to look like a hag. Well, you know, I think it's a great decision on your part, and uh, I think anything you can do to support that, whether it's, you, you know, ramping up on amino acids and 5-HTP and, multi, and, and, you know, B, multi-B stuff, I think it's oh, great. Yeah. I think it's great, you know, and you'll be white knuckling for a while, you know, but then you'll pass a certain point, and you'll get over it, you'll get through it. Yeah. And then, and who knows? You know, maybe you'll get an upgrade from Jack Kerouac. Maybe you'll get, I don't know, William Blake next time or something. So no, I get Juna Barnes, too. But, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. I will keep you all posted with that. I hope everybody had a really safe fourth. How was yours? Incredibly boring, really. I mean, it was really, really boring. I got up, and uh, I worked out, and then I bought some stuff at the, the Central Market to eat. I came home, did a few things, worked on some stuff, made some food, and got a good night's sleep. That was really the extent of it. You know, it wasn't really uh, that big of a deal for me. And because uh, I don't, you know, usually, I mean, the Fourth of July is like a family event. It's like a kid event. 
And if you don't have a family and you don't have a kid, it's it's pretty isolating, to be honest with you. My son was away. He's back east with his relatives. So 4th of July really becomes almost like a non-event for me. And uh, what did I get out of it? I got a good night's sleep. And I watched The Avengers. I watched The Avengers movie finally. That's what I did. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Two, things, two things came out of that for me. Do you want Do you want, do you want to know what they are? Well, you said you got a good night's sleep and you watched well, The Avengers. The Avengers movie. Two things came out of that for me. One All right, was, bring it on. What was a minor kind of realization about the movie? Nothing profound, but then I had, something happened to me during, during my sleep, which actually tripped me out a little bit. So I'm watching the movie, and everybody's got pronounced superpowers, except Black Widow. I'm not really sure what she does, except maybe fight really good and, and somehow manage to get information out of people since she's a super spy. But there's this one scene where they're in New York, and they're fighting this army from you know some other dimension, and all she's got is these little tiny guns. <laughs> what, what is that about? You know, it's like if you're gonna, if you're gonna stick her in that scene, give her a big gun. You know, so, so she can wipe out some of these, uh, you know, nasty you know soldiers from another dimension. And then I thought about it. Well, is a big gun too much of a phallic symbol? Is it giving her too much power? You know, <laughs> you need to keep her yeah. a, little, a little tiny gun. But we'll give her two. Maybe two equals one. Why don't you just give her a big gun? I don't understand that. Anyway, uh, and they could write anything into the plot, right? They could say, hey, we'll give her a big gun, and she could have that. So then, I think everybody needs to check out Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, there's an official trailer on YouTube, and I know Amber Osborne, Miss Destructo, is probably going to love me for this. But, um, yeah, Check out Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and it's um, S-H-I-E-L-D, well, and it's a new show that's coming on this fall. Um, what, well, let me ask yeah. you a question. Why, why did they make Nick Fury black? He used to be you white. You know, I, 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 could probably, I could probably make some um, inquiries on, with regard to that because I'm – I, I know some of the background stuff, the people involved I, with this. I, I would love to know because it's like, you know, it's like he used to be white. Now he's black. I mean, yeah. well, I'm outside the box a little bit here. Okay. I what have if, a feeling it has a lot to do with. Um, what if there was a black I mean, character and they made that character white? I mean, wouldn't the black community be kind of, oh, you're, you're, you're whiteifying our black character. Well, I mean, you know, I and have, that's. We I don't, don't have, have enough time to talk about reverse racism right now. I don't have or I'm just I'm just asking. It's an open, it's an honest question. Why did why did they change his character? That's all. The complexion yeah. is character. I, I think it has a lot to do with um um oh God. Will Smith in, in the movie with Charlize Theron, what was it called? Uh um Cancock. And the popularity of that Hancock. because yeah. What? Well, yeah, Hancock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, uh, the the popularity of that because I, I, there's something to do with regard to uh, Hancock's personality and Nick Fury, and and they need, of course, come on, let's face it, they have to they have to snag everybody. You know, it, this is this is a popularity contest, right? I guess. I mean, I, I mean, you know, speaking of Will Smith, you know, uh, James West in the Wild Wild West, he used to be white, and then Will Smith does a movie, and now he's black in that movie. So here's what I'm thinking. In an equal opportunity society, or in a society where everything is equal, I think there should be a one-to-one trade-off. Like, I think they should do a remake of Shaft and make him white. What do you think of that? Um, I think that's a great idea. Oh, my God, yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, let's just you know, let, let's just mix it all up, you know. And, well, and, and, and then but it, see, then here's the other thing, though. If you had an all-white Miss America contest, you'd get in a lot of trouble, though. I mean, it's okay to have an all-black Miss America contest or an all-Latina Miss America contest, but if you had an all-white Miss America contest, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you know. Sure, but I, I don't know. I just. I, it's just a question that, that I was like, well, why is why did this happen? 
I mean, where did the where did the, where, where did it come down from the comic book god that we would start start to flip scripts on people? Anyway, let me just tell you, I had this. I, I had this. It wasn't really a dream. I don't know what it was, but it was something that uh, that that came to my consciousness, and it was I think it was triggered by the Avengers. It was in my sleep, and I was thinking about the Antichrist, and I and I had this thought that the way that the Antichrist would grab a hold of the people, right, of the people, is that he would take a part of his flesh, you know, a small part of his flesh, which they can clone, by the way, right? And that, that clone flesh would then be inserted into meat products or chemtrails so that every single person on the planet would have a piece, a genetic a genetic uh, piece of the genetic code of the Antichrist so that he could then tap into each and every one of us telepathically or mnemonically. You know what I mean? I thought to myself, well, this is a very strange thought. You know, did this come to me through the Avengers? or I don't know really where it came from, but on a weird level, it made, on a, it made sense in a very strange way that this is how you could control people, right? By inserting your actual DNA into into other people. Well, the bottom line is that that's already happened. Okay, I mean, it's it's our DNA is floating around everywhere. I think it's a fabulous fictional story. I think it would be amazing if somebody would write a book about that. I think Stephen King would love to get a hold of an idea like that. But in, intuitively and instinctually, when I feel something like that in my sacral, I mean, you know, it, the, the second you brush your hair or you spit on the ground or you throw something in the trash after you've blown your nose, the thing is is that we are, are sharing DNA in the weirdest and strangest of ways constantly. What has me a little bit more worried, I'll be really honest with you, um, are <clears throat> our energetic signatures I, I'm actually more worried about our holographic, um, our, our, I'm trying to describe what I'm saying, but I truly believe that this is a holographic universe and that we are just made up of energy. And of course with the White Light Express and having Leah Rose at the center of that as sort of our, you know, our transmitter of, of, of um, the prayer requests, you know, I, I truly believe that those what's happening with all the chemtrails and things like that, I think they're trying to fuck with our energetic signatures. Oh, absolutely. I really do. I, I don't think it has so much to do with our physical being. I, I think it's a mind, body, uh, spirit connection thing. And um, <clears throat> um, my husband was saying to me yesterday, he goes, it's going to be really interesting to see what your aura looks like without nicotine in it in a week. You know, and he yeah. was just kind of looking at me across the table, and he said, and so, you know, with my energetic signature being um, a certain way and yours being a certain way, I'm more concerned about people who can step in and and create a rift or a, a dilemma within our energetic signature. Our flesh vehicles are flesh vehicles. I, I think that, you know, they're compromised already. I started, you know, every time I go on the internet and I start reading more, and I get, I get completely freaked out, and I have to stop. Mm-hmm. I absolutely have to stop. I, I don't, even, I don't even remember what I was reading last night before I fell asleep, and I just went, okay, enough. Mm-hmm. Absolutely enough. Our bodies are so compromised. There's so much going on out there. Oh, it was about Fukushima. That's right. I was blown away. I'm like, oh my God, we're all going to die. That's it. We're done. <laughs> The amount of radiation and radioactive material and everything. I just went, okay, why even bother? I should, I should like, chain smoke. Forget it. <laughs> but the bottom line is that, you know, our flesh vehicles, it, they're just flesh vehicles. I'm more concerned about what's happening to our energetic signatures. Yeah, well, I, th- I think that that's a real concern, especially when we start dealing with ELFs and all the other uh, frequencies that are bombarding us. And they are amplified by what's in our blood, which is a high amount of aluminum and um, iron oxide and all the other stuff that are coming down through the chemtrails. So the body does matter because our energetic signature is uh, impeded by that, uh, especially with metals. 
Hey, sir, we gotta we gotta shove off here, but I want to. Yeah, we gotta go. Just talk. Just like, how's it going with the uh, the White Light Express and uh, how are signups going and all that stuff? Yeah, man, no, we, I, I got to get people to understand that George Norrie is coming here to the West Coast. It's a very intimate evening. There's only room for 100 more sign-ups. They, they got to get them now. They got to get them now, and it's going to be a fabulous evening. Of course, the incredible um, Mystic Healer, Sonia Grace, is uh, teaching her Future You workshop. You get to change you get to take a look at yourself in the future. It's phenomenal. I, I've done it. I did this at the Women of Wisdom conference. But yeah, there's only room for a few more people, and I got to, I got to get them to sign up now. Okay. I, they got to go to the WhiteLightExpress.com, hit on conference, and boom, do it. So it's uh, you and Sonia Grace and George Nori and Peter. And Peter Messer Schmidt. Yeah, That's my husband right. is doing his uh, highly sensitive man for right. the HSP community. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, of course, I have a local uh, musician, Shannon Ryan, who is just phenomenal. She does this, uh, she's got a, the voice of an angel. She okay. does harps and singing bowls. So okay, it's going to be an amazing dates, weekend. Can, what are the dates? August 16th, 17th, and 18th. So right around the corner, and uh, the location is divine. It's... Uh, uh, in Washington, the Olympic Peninsula, Port Townsend, that alone is worth the journey. So um, it really is, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And cosm and uh, cosmictriage.com is where they can find out more about that, right? No, White Light Express. White, White Light, Light Express. Okay, White Light Express. I have Cosmic Triage up on the uh, web page. I, I got to put something up there too. It's it's. And, I uh, should. Yeah. I've, I've been. Yeah. Remiss. Okay. So, hey, thank you for calling in, and, and best of luck with you. On the on the nicotine front, <clears throat> and we'll catch up with you in a month. We'll find out how that's going. All right. Right on. Okay. <laughs> See ya. Bye. That's our good friend Sarah Nash. Thirty minutes of your reverence every first Friday, and it seems to be that there is a plethora of very <laughs> excuse me. I'm channeling her nicotine. Uh, really interesting and powerful women that are assembling in the Pacific Northwest. We've had uh, Randy Diddy on the show here before and, and talking about her wonderful organ magic. Well, let's bring on another very powerful healer and teacher, medicine woman from the Northwest. She's the author of Love and Spirit Medicine. Her name is Shauna, Shauna Holm, and uh, let's welcome her to the show. Here we go. Hello, Shauna. Hey, hey, thank you. It's so good to be here. And, you know, what a small world because when, um, is it Sarah, the woman you were just speaking with? Right. When she was talking about the musician, uh, Shannon Ryan, I know yeah. Shannon very well. She took care of my daughters a few years ago when oh, I was wow. in Egypt. Yeah, she's exquisite. So I'm just marveling at, at what a small world this is. It's getting yeah. smaller by the day. So so you can vouch for uh, Shannon's uh lovely voice and uh, singing abilities and all that stuff? Oh, she's, she is like a fairy princess. And, in fact, when I, I was in Egypt and I called home to check on the girls, and my daughter Serena said, oh, Mommy, I'm in bed right now, and Shannon is playing her harp till I fall asleep. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I told everyone, well, I have a fairy princess who's taking care of my girls. It's all good. <laughs> How did you, know? you swing so, that? Yeah. that? That's amazing. How did you swing that? Yeah. How, it, this is welcome to my life. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I meet the most amazing people. <clears throat> let's, let's talk about your life. You have a new book out, Love and Spirit Medicine, which uh, uh, I finished last week. And it is a really uh, interesting and thought-provoking read on many levels. And the language that you use to convey your experiences in this book are just top notch. Not only is it a really interesting story, but it's incredibly well written. And the synopsis is, and if, if you can jump in here, the synopsis is, is that um, you're going through the breakup of a marriage, a very painful breakup, and uh, you meet somebody who becomes your partner in spirit medicine journeys and becomes your lover uh, at the same time. And the two of them become intertwined in a very deep and profound way until at some point you have to make a, 
a break and a split with your your uh, your lover and your spirit medicine partner. And that's when, in a lot of ways, the real work of the book in your life begins in, in, in those moments. Uh, and it's a very uh, uh, revealing and confessional, very honest book. And anybody that has any kind of interest in entheogens and psilocybin uh, and the intensity of connecting with another person would find this book to be right up their alley. How did I do? Oh my God! I, I thank you so much, Robert. Yeah, and 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 it, it is so uh, meaningful to me when I'm interviewed that the interviewer has actually taken the time to read the book. So that just says so much about your own integrity. And and thank you. Yes, that is that is the book. And and uh, I during that process, I I'm a, a really voracious researcher, and I have read probably over 40 books at this point on and theogenic mushrooms and theogens and the great majority are written by men and 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 they've been great books you know really informative but i was really trying to find a woman's experience you know and 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 not a woman's academic experience we have plenty of that in this culture you know i wanted to um hear about you know the applicable use of this medicine to you know, someone's life experience. And so I really ended up writing that book. And yes, it is a very vulnerable telling that there is so much power in, I think, vulnerability and so much beauty in vulnerability. And we live in a society that is so all consumed with title, you know, and it's so all consumed with what your, your sort of external face. And, uh, and I really like to take it to, uh, a much more profound level of our truth, you know. I mean, we're all doing our best here, and we're all seeking, and we're all suffering in our own way, you know. And mm-hmm. um, and uh, and these medicines will alleviate that suffering. They'll take you to the heart of it, which is pretty scary. I think most people would rather run through mm-hmm. the use of you know some kind of suppressant, but um, you know, really, the only way out of it is is through it, and it is through these um, dark nights of the soul where the resources can be found, you know. Mm-hmm. That's, um, that's where the treasure is, and, and boy, this medicine can take you there, as I discovered. Well, let's, let's go back in time and, and track this a little bit. You were mm-hmm. originally married and living in New York, and, ta- and, and based on the description uh, of your life there, you had the it life. You had a you had a practice, uh, interior decorating, design. Mm-hmm. Uh, your husband was successful. You had dinner mm-hmm. parties. You had two kids. I mean, you guys were, you know, tripping the life fantastic in New York. And then you moved to Seattle. And I just have to tell you, your description of Seattle in the book um, absolutely fits my experience with Seattle because, and, and ironically. I went through a divorce in Seattle as well. I moved from huh. San Francisco to Seattle, and when I found people in Seattle to be uh, cordial but not friendly, and I never really felt very much invited uh, in in Seattle, and that kind of fed into my sense of isolation there for for a number of reasons. But um, that's where I went through through my my experience. That was very painful and. I didn't. I didn't take. I didn't take uh, the entheogens, but I went through my own kind of my own medicine journey. I worked. I actually worked with a with a shaman. I did some fasting. I did. You know, I, I did my own thing while I was there. So, I don't know what it is about Seattle. If you want to end your marriage, just go move to Seattle. I think. <laughs> well, I will say though that uh, because I still live here and it's been um, eleven years now that. The women, like you were saying at the beginning, the women are amazing, and there are some amazing men here too. But I really, I mean, I've created community through, I just started these monthly full moon ceremonies for women, God, four years ago. And, um, you know, I thought only a few would come, and 22 women answered in in the affirmative and 17 ended up coming and the other five actually wrote and said look i I can't make it but let me know when another one when you're going to do another one and and so for the past four years i have created an amazing um place for women to gather and commune you know and and um and uh engage the sacred and uh and so i have amazing friends here but you got to really seek them out and and then at the same time there is a rather large community of people who i find it's sort of hard to break into but those aren't my people 
It's very right. simple. Right. Got it. So um, in your book, you you have a very challenging relationship with, at that time, your, your husband's children. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I think you convey the frustrations of being, and I've never experienced this, but you convey the frustrations of, of working and dealing with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, other people's children as part of a mixed marriage where, where two families come together, but also two uh, very different styles of, of relating and raising children. And when I was reading that in the book, I was it seemed to be incredibly frustrating. And I'm just wondering how that's resolved for you. What what are the relationships like with uh, with Richard's kids now? Uh, well, in the book, I I go into how it you know it was his daughter in particular that was um, you know who was going through a really really rough time and and um, and really the marriage really fell apart around that. Uh, however. Um, in the book, towards the end, she came to me and, and apologized, you know, and she's really pulled herself together beautifully. And so now we actually have a lovely relationship. And, um, you know, his son uh, sort of does his own thing, you know. Um, so uh, whatever, that's sort of neither here nor there. But then also Richard and myself also uh, came to this beautiful place at the end of the book, you know, uh, where now we're very good friends. And um, and so it, it really resolved itself so well. But it resolved itself, I think, also because of the deep work that I was doing. You know, in other words, I wasn't waiting for them to kind of come around and get their act together with my finger b- pointing and blame, you know. I was constantly working on my own my own self and evolving my own self. And then, you know, these sort of synchronistic experiences happened with them. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I can honestly say that, that, you know, my relationships to all the, you know, the, the close people in my life are, they're good. You know, like if I was to leave the earth today, I'd leave on good terms with everyone. Well, that's, you know, that a lot of people can't say that. So congratulations on that. That's, that's good stuff. Um, the per- the person that is your partner in this book, his name is uh, Leaf. Mm-hmm. Is that his real name, Leaf? No, no. Okay. No, I changed everyone's names in the book. Okay, because I I thought because uh, it seemed to be a very fitting name for that personality that you described in the book. So, uh, he Leaf is uh, if, if, for people who haven't read the book, he's kind of a pan like figure, very outdoorsy, mm-hmm. uh, very connected to the woods and forest. And I was I was really kind of blown away by the by the cycle of your and, and I'm I'm assuming that this is linear because when you yes. when when you guys hook up and meet it feels to me like it's maybe early spring or something like that and you're outside and the uh, the the energy and the imagery around uh, the the medicine is joyous it's alive it's enervating. And so is the quality and the contact of your connection with Leaf. And as you go through the book, you get to this really dark patch of ice in December where everything really, mm-hmm. really changes. Did you notice that the, the, the journeys and the medicine and the relationship itself was taking kind of a, a cyclical and seasonal kind of arc while you were in it? Yes, I did. God, that is so, such an astute observation of yours. Not only did I notice that, but also my time with Leaf, uh, which was about probably around five months, and then and then it ended so suddenly, so painfully. Well, I also talk in the book about my core wound, which is that I was adopted. Well, it occurred to me, oh my God, I was adopted at five months, and this relationship with Leaf lasted five now i knew him for we were friends for two years before that but this love deep love connection was for five months as well and so i realized my god i'm like repeating patterns that began at the very start of my life with this man you know and and i also realized because he's a gemini and 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 he he really was like two people that he really represented everyone who ever loved me in my life and also everyone who ever hated and abused me. Mm-hmm. So it was it was a relationship par excellence when it comes to just 
pulling from you every unresolved piece, you know, that must come to the surface for healing. It was profound. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um, parts of the book are quite graphic, and you talk about the orgasmic energy that is coursing through your body, especially during the early uh, uh, entheogenic trips. Mm-hmm. Can, you, can you talk a little bit about that and how it might relate to Kundalini? And then I, and then I want to ask you uh, something about what happens in December as, uh, that relates to that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, okay, so in the book I also I talk about how a few years before that, several years before that, when I came into my shamanic work, I, I had created a circle in the, out in the desert. I was, I was um, doing a 10-day immersion with a teacher, Brew Joy, who's since passed. And when I did that circle, I, I opened up a vortex um, that I did just sort of through my own kind of inner guidance. And then I laid down in that circle, and I spent three days in that circle. And one of the things that happened was my kundalini opened in that circle. And, um, and there was energy uh, moving through my body, and it was, it was, it was uh, soft, uh, but very, very sensual, and my entire body would quake. And then for a year after that, every time I laid down to go to bed at night, I would quake. I quaked for a year. And so then how interesting that on the medicine, my second time doing the medicine, I was lying down again out in, outside in the woods at night, and and the medicine announced, well, we're going to work on your second chakra tonight. And I said, okay, fine. I had no idea what that meant. And these waves of energy were began coursing from you know my genital area up 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 to my throat and up into my face and so um and i know that was the kundalini and i had since after that read that there were instances where people who would work with plant medicine would sometimes have their kundalini stimulated but when this happened to me i mean it was so 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 powerful it it was indescribable and i had what I can only tell you was a full body orgasm, like a cataclysm, not a cataclysm. Well, yeah, I mean, it was like, <laughs> it was, it was overwhelming. It was unbelievable. And, and so, um, then, uh, yeah, a few times after that, where I did the medicine, again, I would have those extraordinary experiences. And what it felt like to me also was the earth's energy was coming into me and the earth was making love to me. She is a very sensual being, and then this, you know, there are stories also of the nymphs in, you know, Greco-Roman times, who would be um, the priestesses. Is really a nymph means a priestess. They would be in ecstatic states, you know, just out in the fields. And I guarantee it's because they were working with plant medicines. Right. So yeah. So you ha- you have this ecstatic experience, mm-hmm. and there is a very strong connection for you with. Uh, leaf as Pan, and Pan mm-hmm. imagery comes up all over uh, the book in your journey. You take pictures of Pan, uh, like in the fire or the leaves, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and so Leaf has become this personification of Pan, this archetype. And then in, in December, everything kind of shifts. I want to read this passage, if you don't mind. Please. And it's... And it, uh, it goes like this. You start off with, uh, let's see, I was going in and out of consciousness once again, and at one point I came to and began experiencing the full body orgasms of kundalini energy. I was feeling leaf all around me, but I didn't have a sense of his actual body. It was as if we were two energy beings experiencing the purest love for each other. The feeling was one of exquisite joy and pleasure in being together. I was telling him how much I loved him, how beautiful he was, how sweet we were deep in a place of mutual adoration and love. Again, I slipped away into unconsciousness, and when I awoke, I felt myself as the earth, changing seasons. I felt myself as winter at that point, cold and soporific. Leaf was asking me to come out into the moonlight and sit with, in the hot tub with him. I had the sense that I was the moon and he was spirit, calling me out of my dark slumber. Finally, I agreed, and he picked me up and carried me into the frigid, clear moonlit night in that moment everything changed abruptly something came over me and i fought to get out of his arms he let me go and when i looked up at him i saw the most beautiful and terrible sight illuminated by the moon leaf was the figure of pan standing before me bare-chested and very muscular he had the beard and the horns 
and these extraordinary hairy goat legs. Only this was not a friendly pan. He asked me, who do you think I am? And when he spoke, I saw fang teeth. I was terrified. When I get scared, I do not scream or run. I usually stand and fight. But in that moment, I rushed to the door to get inside. Away from him in the freezing cold air, once inside, I fell to the floor in a ball, shivering from the cold. I could not find a blanket, and I was deep in the rabbit hole of the medicine. The entire room looked dank and dark to me. I wondered if I was Persephone trapped in Hades with a demon guardian. In my mind, Leaf had become this beast, and I prayed he would turn back into the Leaf I knew. Instead, he became more demonic and beast-like. Leaf came in, back inside, wet and cold from the hot tub. I asked him to hold me, thinking that he would somehow remember himself and be restored to normal. He was soaking wet, and I felt no solace. I was horrified when I felt coarse, furry legs against mine. I felt his feet as cloven hooves, which sent a chill through my body. He got up and said, you have something dark in you. This is a very powerful uh, moment for you. I think this is the pivot in your relationship with him, is it not? Yes. And so let me ask you this. Knowing that Leaf is a Gemini now, was he both good pan and bad pan? Or was this experience that you've been experiencing with the ecstatic pleasure, was this somehow part of the succubus all along and was just the face of it was just revealing itself to you. How did you resolve all of this? Ah, you gave me a full body chill with that last part of the question. Was the face of it just revealing itself to you? I wonder about that, Robert. That's something I wonder about. It's a very good question. Um, I'm not even sure where to begin on how to answer that. Because um, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's really powerful, and you're playing in some extremely deep and archetypal and elemental spaces. And you're, mm-hmm. you, you know, you have your guides and such, but really you're, you're alone. And, and when I read that passage, you know, and the shift and the transformation went on in the earlier stages, I, I, I mean, I was just one, for me personally, I was like, how does this get resolved? Because it's powerful and it's dark and... We don't have any reference points for that. No, and yet it's interesting because my work, I would say, the primary crux of my work, I mean, my work is heart-centered. The foundation of my work is the heart and shadow. And, and, And it is really only through the heart that the shadow can be held, you know, can be really, really seen because the ego just can't handle it, right? So, um, and that whole experience was one and my experience with leaf was of i think really of of shadow and light like the way i described him earlier in this conversation that i realized god he was the personification of everyone who ever loved me but also everyone who ever hated and abused me because he could be horribly cruel you know Mm. and cold um and uh and so that also felt to me almost like the medicine also announcing it, 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 it was multiple levels, but the medicine and announcing that, um, you know, all is not as it seems, and we're going to take you into a much deeper understanding here of, of really what's going on beneath beneath the surface. And uh, it was a loss of innocence as well mm-hmm. uh, on a number of levels, a loss of innocence. I can be very childlike and naive at times i will admit at the tender age of 50 i still can but you know that it, it works for me too because it keeps me curious and it keeps you know keeps me um seeking and open uh and uh at the same time too there is a demon that he has talked about that stalks him and uh, i didn't go into this too much in detail in the book but my sense too was that i i picked up that demon um which and that's a whole other conversation, but um, I, that, I finally shed that demon a couple of months ago in a peyote ceremony. It took 14 hours in the peyote and 55, 14 hours in the te- uh, teepee and 55 women to finally let go of that thing. Um, so that came in, um, and yeah, and then nothing was the same with him ever again, ever again. Yeah, you know? it, yeah. I mean, I'm wondering too if you saw something about him you know, that that he could just could not handle, that you had seen some kind of deep 
uh, I don't know, actualization of, of, you know, some multidimensional part of himself. And then once, uh-huh. once you saw that and were witness to that, he, he could not be with you anymore. I mean, that, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, I, well, I think that's very compelling, and I will tell you as an astrologist, you'll appreciate this too. Okay, um, he's also Scorpio moon and Scorpio rising. Okay, there you go, yeah. Yeah, um, and, and yeah, and then also on that journey, which I did talk about in the book, I, I did see also a lifetime, and it was so disturbing to me that I, I didn't share it with him right away, but I yeah. saw a lifetime where we were together where he was, and I, I don't know if we were Aztec or Mayan or what we were, but I was on the sacrificial slab, and I was, um, I was later told this, that I was 12, um, and he was one of those dark priests, and he cut my heart out and then lifted it to the light above and by the way when they do that I was also told this it was explained to me on the medicine when they would do those kind of sacrifices and they took the heart out the heart is where the gold is and mm-hmm. um, so then they would then draw in your essence through your heart just you know they didn't cut out your liver they didn't cut out your spleen they cut out your heart there's a reason in any case I, that freaked me out um, but I, I realized also huh this is interesting if this is indeed so, and I, I know it is now. So at a lifetime where that happened, and that sent me into a profound transformation, the ultimate, right? Death. Mm-hmm. And now here he's cut my heart out again, you know, sending me into another very deep and profound uh, uh, transformative process. Only this time it's not on the death planes, you know. I'm going to be able to go through that transformation you know, and, and, and really live to be the full expression of it in this lifetime. And, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, and that really did, that shifted the book entirely, and it shifted my medicine experiences entirely, because then the next medicine experience after that, I went in by myself, and that's when White Owl came to me, and right. everything changed. Yeah, and the then, owl a huge role in this book as it relates to, uh, a spirit guide and a totem it's it's all over the place and so and and eagle as well you also had some mm-hmm. eagle medicine show up and yep. uh, some of this is in relation to uh, the medicine journeys you began to take with women which I thought was interesting you went from you know uh, journeying and and taking the medicine with leaf and then that stops and then you shift and now you're with your your friends and and your your you know your fellow seekers, but they're they're female at this point. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of a balancing out that takes place too, in some ways, uh, towards the end of the book as well. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting and that's very true. Yeah, I have not, um, I haven't journeyed with another man since Leaf, and and when I do journey in that way, <clears throat> it's very very intimate. You know, and 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 when I journey, beings come into me. This is something else that, you know, I just I I didn't really know anything about this medicine, and and I just recently spoke at the Women's Visionary Congress at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and I was super sonically nervous to speak, because I really thought, you know, I'm among my peers, and this is probably old news to them, um, but it's not. My experiences actually are not that common, so. Um, but, but these beings come in, and it's an ancient form of shamanism where the shaman goes into alternative reality to speak with the spirits. But some shamans will allow the spirits to come and animate them. And, and that is what happened to me, and it began early on, and then it really uh, uh, kicked in, you know, when I was with my, my female friends. And, uh, and it still happens to this day where they come through. So I always bring a recorder with me now. Um, but it, you know, it can also be disruptive to the other, the other person. So me doing this medicine in a group is, you know, not not a good idea unless I'm actually going in as medicine oracle, which I've done a few times. One of the things that uh, a casual reader of the book might wonder or ask is that you're a mother of two, two girls. Uh, I mm-hmm. think they're in their teens now. Am I right? Yep. Yep. While, yep. while you're going through all of these journeys, there's a whole other side of you, which is a mother, uh-huh. which has a of these two girls, which doesn't really come out in the book very much. Now, what one could assume that you were really more fixated and focused on your medicine journey, but that may not necessarily be a fair characterization of your relationship with your daughters. Can you talk about what it was like to be a mother going through this during this phase? Yes, 
yes. Um, I didn't um, focus on the girls in the book because, A, you know, it was it was on this other topic, but also just to kind of keep them more private as well. Right. Um, but I will say that, um, yeah, while I was going through this, obviously they were never around. I was always off in the woods. And I, I, I spoke to that in the book that they would always be with their father, and that's always been my quote-unquote policy. Um, However, because of the tremendous expansion of consciousness that this medicine uh, brings you to, uh, it even deepened my already close relationship with my girls. And I, you know, I I didn't discuss my medicine journeys with them or or um, really my use of the medicine. I mean, they know I work with it, and 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 and. Um, and actually, we've had some really good discussions since then. But um, no, actually, you know, I would have these medicine journeys. And so I, I, being a mother really grounded me mm-hmm. because I can go off into those realms. It's, it's a portal. I, 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 I say that it's when I take the medicine, it's like going through the portal to sit on God's lap and talk to the spirits. And I love those worlds. I love those realms. I love those beings. And at the same time, then I have to. I must return, and then I must be a mother to my my girls. And so what it has taught me to do, which I'm pretty good at, really good at, is to shift states of consciousness <laughs> very quickly, <laughs> which is almost surreal. You know, you're like, wait a minute, I was just like talking to this, you know, Pleiadian someone, <laughs> and now I'm, you know, going to soccer practice. Uh, but that's also, I, I, I like the humor in that as well, you know. And right. and and the the understanding that that life is it's so rich. There's so much to this, you know. That that uh, yes, you can be a, a, a beautiful mother to your children and 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 be very available to them on on very deep levels. And 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 you can um, do the mundane, and you can also go into um, the sacred, and that ultimately the whole the whole dance is sacred. It is one sacred dance, you know. And so, it's made me a better mother, if anything. And I joke with my girls anyway. I'm like, Do you know how cool I am? Do you have any idea how cool your mother is? <laughs> so they, anyway, <laughs> absolutely not. And let's not go there, Mom. Right. <laughs> Just stay uh, cool for us. Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to ask you too about the dynamic of your journey, and I don't I don't want this to sound pejorative because I don't I don't think it is, but I also want to kind of address it because generally speaking, like if you get into like McKenna or you get into even Leary or you know and, you know Gordon Wasson, a lot you know Ralph Metzner, a lot a lot of these guys who are the you know, the explorers of altered states of consciousness, number one, they're men. And yep. number two, they're talking about mind states or they're mm-hmm. talking about, uh, you know, interdimensional language or hyperdimensional physics. And, you know, they're not talking about relationship. And mm-hmm. here you are kind of a pioneer in that you're a woman doing this. And it kind of falls into this camp that the way that you would do it would be through relationship. And yes, you do go into the mind states, and you do go into a lot of the languaging, which is kind of this bridge between a, a quote-unquote masculine and feminine version of the two. But this is this is the vehicle that that you've chosen. It's through relationship. Do you think that this is just part and parcel of sex difference, or this is just your experience? Well, I think life is relationship. First of all, it's our relationship relationships with the people in our life and our relationship ultimately to ourself. And I do think that the guys um, tend to turn this into a bit of an intellectual exercise. And, right. and, and again, I've, you know, I've read all their books. I've read all McKenna's books. And I have a quick uh, story to say about McKenna. Um, you can go on Psychedelic Salon um, and look up podcast number 316 where Dr. Bruce Damer, who was dear friends with Terrence McKenna and was with him when he died, uh, told a story that not many people know about, and that is 12, uh, 12 years before McKenna's death, 
um, the mushroom, he did a mushroom journey, and the mushroom turned on him. And the mushroom said, it's not about machine elves. It's not about dancing mice. You're going to get a taste, a dose of you, Terrence. You're going to find out, you know, who you are. What are you to yourself? And so when he came out of that journey, he was all freaked out. And I think his brother Dennis was with him and someone else, and, and he said something like, everything I've been saying is bullshit, you know? And he went into an existential crisis and, and questioned everything and realized, you know, holy shit, I've been talking about, you know, this mushrooms as this whole sort of ideas and the mind. And, and, um, and so Dennis, I think, said to him, so what are you going to do? Because meanwhile, he had all these talks scheduled i mean this was paying the bills and he had this whole fan base really you know people who just adored him and and he was quite the bard right and quite the intellectual and and and, um he chose to just go the same route it was too much for him to really explore the deeper context of going into the ground of himself you know and really into the heart of the matter shall we say in his own heart and he wasn't able to to do it and he lived for the you know, the re- remaining 12 years till he died in fear of that medicine, but he never told anyone other than his closest friends. So that on his deathbed, and yes, it is really true that he did have a mushroom-shaped tumor, and, and it was as if the mushroom was literally consuming his mind, which was, you know, because the beings have said to me, you can't get to the heart through the mind. You can't. Right. Um, and so on his deathbed, he said, he got the epiphany, he said, wait a minute, it's not about thinking, it's not about ideas, it's about love. Mm -hmm. Which is why I called my book Love and Spirit Medicine, because this medicine is spirit medicine, and it takes you into love. Love for yourself and for everyone around us. That it is that that connectedness that we have, and and this whole thing about we're all one. Yes, we're part of the one, but we are individual. We're individual frequency signatures. We're like, you know, individual shimmers on this one jewel. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. I wanted to ask you. Just have a few more minutes left. I wanted yeah. to ask you about the different qualities of the different types of medicine: ayahuasca versus peyote versus mushrooms versus DMT. Can you just give a quick encapsulation of? what your experience is like with those various substances and why you you seem to come back again to the mushroom? Sure. Um, I experienced ayahuasca first, and that was with a, a circle of women, which was wonderful, because um, this is synchronicity in my life. I was complaining about the dearth of women, you know, ayahuasqueras, you know, um, ayahuasca shamans, because I was hearing all these stories of these male shamans, um, you know, raping women and stuff on the medicine. And lo and behold, I hear about two women ayahuasca shamans holding a circle of women. So I did that. And um, and I did the ayahuasca three or four times, but it just, it came to me, this is not your medicine, Shauna. And the mushroom was calling me loud and clear. And so obviously the mushroom is my medicine. And since then, I have experienced the peyote. And the peyote is very, very different because, um, you know, the mushroom and the ayahuasca, you know, your eyes are closed and it's this, this very interior piece. The peyote, your eyes are open and, and you're in a teepee in a circle and you're looking into the fire and you are there working on a communal prayer for whoever has sponsored, has called in the ceremony and they want you to pray for their child who's sick or their mother who's dying or, or a wedding, or, you know, whatever it is, right? So, um, and then that it's a grandfather peyote. It's just a very different frequency and, and I had a profound healing with the peyote, um, as I alluded to before. Um, I've also worked with 5-MeO-DMT from the bark of the acacia tree, um, mm-hmm. not from the frog. And um, and that you smoke and that will, you know, it, it's much more powerful than the mushroom. It's a shorter experience. Um, and I had a very deep and rich experience with that. Um, but I don't actually care for it. So that's not my medicine right. either you know it just it came to me like all right yes and this is your medicine and i will quickly also say i heard a woman talk at the women's visionary congress about the ayahuasca and how a lot of these women become sort of brides of ayahuasca you know and they she was talking about how it's like a jealous medicine too you know like it you know and and i thought um that's strange that sounds like an enchantment to me you know like i don't i'm, I'm not into that um right. 
because the mushroom, I don't have that at all. The mushroom, in fact, the mushroom said, we have a beautiful man for you coming down the road. You know, there's no jealousy. And there's no, like, you will only use this. You know, it's all, the mushroom for me has been about empowerment. Empowerment and coming into my own authority as a divine being. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so there's been no sort of, in terms of like a medicine a plant teacher kind of taking over you and being demanding or jealous or any of that kind of thing, which, I, you know, obviously, I mean, I'd never heard of that before until the conference that, that sometimes happens with ayahuasca. But, um, you know, I find for myself the mushroom to be the greatest source for my own um, explorations into my own divinity and the divinity of, of every other being that mm-hmm. surrounds me. Let's talk about your work outside of the book. Um, you are a, a shaman. You're a healer. And when you say shaman, we can say that because you've done some serious work. You've you've gone to Mexico and studied with elders. You're not you're not some weekend warrior. You, you really put your time in, and you've done some rigorous uh, journeys with uh, the medicine. Uh, and you're also a spell breaker as well. Can you talk a little bit about spell breaking and? Maybe just your work in general. People want to find out more about what you do and how they can tap into your resources. Yes, of course. Um, my website, by the way, is shaunahome.com, which is on your, I saw your radio program, S-H-O-N-A-G-H-H-O-M-E.com. And so as a, I call myself a spellbreaker because um, doing this medicine with the intensity that I have done it is really like taking the red pill in the matrix. And... Um, and this medicine has revealed to me what we are in, the system we are in, which is a legal system of commerce, by the way, and it goes back to ecclesiastical law and, and, and way beyond that. Um, and so, and because I work with a shadow and my medicine is owl, <laughs> what does owl do? Owl not only has wisdom, owl sees in the dark, which means owl sees what others can't, and owl sees what others won't see, and owl sees what others don't want to see. So, I joke that Al can be a bit of a wet blanket at times. I mean, this is powerful medicine and, and, and not the easiest medicine to swallow. But there are so many people, I'm seeing men and women, who are being um, called to the owl. You know, it's really coming to them. And I know it's because we're in a period of this darkness that we're in where we must see now. We must. It is essential. So when I work with people, I go, I take them deep. And it's interesting because I don't get beginners. I get people who are pretty far along on the path, and I take them into the very depth of of what it is that they need to see so that they can make that critical shift. And so I do this with my students and groups, and I do this one-on-one when I'm working with people. My work is very intimate. And uh, and as a spell breaker, yeah, I break, I break the spell. The entire world is spellbound, as I'm sure you know. We've been under the spell for a long time, and uh, and so we are, we're, we're beginning to come out out of that. And and you must see because a spell will work primarily, you know, when you believe in it, and you can be under a spell and, and not even know you're under a spell, which is what you know what we pretty much the case we've got going on here. So so I make it my business <laughs> for those who come to me and ask, of course, to uh, open their eyes to what is going on both in their personal life and also the world at large. Why? So that they can uh, t- take the sacred action because it's not enough to sort of sit and do our meditation and do our umming and schlumming and whatnot. I mean, shit's hitting the fan out here, you know. This requires action. That's part of that sacred trinity. It's thought, emotion, and action. Action's what is birthed from your thinking and your feeling, right? So, so, um, so yeah, so I, I, I bring people to that place. And not everybody, like I said, wants to... to um, to know about that kind of thing, but it's essential that we do. And I'll say real quick, too, when I was on the medicine uh, one time, the trees were speaking to me, and I had been calling myself an earth citizen, and the trees said, dear one, do not call yourself an earth citizen. Citizen is a Roman word. You are an earth sovereign. And you know what? I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know about any of that stuff. And these beings teach me with what I call coyote teachings, So, you know, we are high beings. We are divine beings. So they're not going to give us all the answers like we're infants. 
They'll give right. us clues because it's a game. And then we're expected with our fine intellect and our, sh- our sharp acuity to then go and seek and do some more digging with those good clues that they, that they gave us, you know. And then you get those aha moments and those, you know, realizations and, and, uh, and you know, the learning just really deepens. And so that's what I've been doing since then. I've been, you know, exploring all of that. And, ooh, there's the matrix right there. So right. much. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's a it's a uh, delightful book, a really great read. I highly recommend it. If you have any interest in in theogens, medicine, relationships, facing the shadow, working with really profound and intense material, facing your fear and finding joy, delight, and even some resolution and peace, this is this book is where it's at. Love and Spirit Medicine. Shauna, thank you for coming on the show and. Let's have you back on again sometime. You're a terrific guest. Oh, thank you, Robert. It, it was an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take good care. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. That was uh, Shana. Big shout-out to her. Great, great, great little segment there. Uh, so in a moment or two, I'm going to be uh, bringing Kenneth Warren on, and we're going to be talking about Vincent Farini and the life of Farini. But uh, before we do, let's have a little bit of a segue. Let's let you get up, take a pee, and uh, have a tea or something, glass of water, and then strap in for the next, uh, oh, what time is it now? The next 40 minutes. So let's play a little uh, John Trudell. This is Grass Fire. And uh, John, I think, is going to be coming back in the show in uh, a month or two as we heat up and get closer to some more interesting events in the world of hemp. And uh, John is a uh, First Nation person and no doubt very familiar with some of the sacred substances that we've been talking about today. Here's Grassfire. I'll be back in four minutes. We'll be talking with Kenneth Warren about the life and times of Vincent Farini. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a really interesting conversation, and you're going to learn about a fascinating figure in American history that not a lot of people are aware of but need to be. Here's John Trudell.
with the unnatural reality. They need to see. They need to be. Grassfire. My DNA needs THC. Dreaming of long times past. All that those times brought. Looking to the heart of tomorrow. Grass fire in a world that yearns. That's the way this fire burns. That was John Trudell, and the name of the tune is Grassfire. John, of course, being uh, one of the great advocates of hemp in our current milieu, and his voice of protest goes all the way back to Alcatraz, where he first made a name for himself in the American Indian movement when they occupied that big, cold rock in the middle of San Francisco Bay, straight across from uh, the city by the bay. That's where John came onto the scene, and he's still doing his best to make some waves and bring some change, positive change, to the people in this country and this planet. All right, speaking of positive change, let's take a positive change of direction here and uh, bring on Kenneth Warren, my good buddy, uh, who just returned from a... A journey to Gloucester, Massachusetts, where he took part in a, a revival of sort of the life of Vincent Farini, and it was quite successful. And we're going to talk about what that experience was like in the life of Farini as well. Maybe you'll even read a couple of Farini's poems for us. Here he is, my good buddy, Kenneth Warren. Hey, Ken. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Robert. How Great to you? be with you. Good to have you Fine, here. Thanks. Man. Yep. So uh, it, how's it going? How's it going up there in your little Xanadu in the woods? It's uh, it's beautiful on the lake here. Yeah. Imagine. So how was the uh, how was the Farini event? Small, uh, the Farini event was absolutely uh, a marvelous gathering of uh, of, of poets and uh, and uh, friends and lovers that uh, were inspired by uh, the man and his uh, and his work. Uh, there were about uh, eight of us uh, there that uh, uh, looked at uh, his uh, the long arc of his life, and uh, you know he was born in 1913 in uh, Saugus, Massachusetts. And uh, you know it's interesting when you think about 1913 as the year that the Federal Reserve was instituted. So you you really with his life you get a sense of uh, the entire arc of the uh, the twentieth century from the privatization of the the currency uh, the poverty of the Great Depression uh, the struggle over political and economic systems and you have a working class Italian uh, first generation immigrant uh, who grew up in uh, the shoe city of Lynn. Uh, coming to terms with uh, uh, the force of poverty, the force of poetry, and the demands of his own uh, uh, personal psychological uh, identity. And uh, it makes for uh, a wonderful opus uh, that uh, that really connects with uh, much of what you've been uh, laying up about this rectification of social conscience uh, under the uh, the Jupiter uh, in Cancer opportunity now, uh, because Farini is a, kind of a quintessentially uh, Cancerian lunar uh, poet, and uh, that uh, that relationship to Mother Nature, uh, nurturance, uh, the maternal principle, uh, an ethic of care is. Uh, written uh throughout his uh, throughout his poetry so it's uh, it's a real 
a real pleasure to be here uh, with you at this uh, at this particular time uh, when we celebrate the centenary of uh, of Vincent's uh, life. Just to remind people, Ken has been on the show before, and we had a great discussion about uh, his metacritical work, Captain Poetry, Sucker Punch, A Guide to the Homeric Punk Hole, 1980 to 2012, which you can uh, find on Amazon if you have any interest in poetry, Charles Olson, uh, metacritical thinking, uh, highly recommended. It. It's a great, great read. And if there's anybody that has uh, the, uh, the street cred to talk about Perini in the way that uh, Ken's about to do, it is Ken. One of the things that uh, is interesting for me, at least so it seems, is that Perini was way ahead of the curve. Like he saw the disenfranchisement of the individual, especially as it related to what was taking place on the industrial and the economic landscape. And it seems like the more that that took place around Farini and his life, the more that he became sort of uh, determined and committed to make him, himself sort of the living, breathing experience of the poem itself. There, there's this interesting distillation of the individual uh, as an archetypal expression via Farini against the collapsing, eroding, and dissolving social structures which he saw at the time. Oh, you're absolutely you're absolutely on the money. Uh, you know, his voice comes out of uh, of the labor struggles, the Great Depression, uh, the dispossession of, uh, of of the shoe industry, the movement to the South. Uh, when I was first working uh, with uh, with Vince on his work, uh, which would have been in the very early '90s, and I was reading his poems from the uh, from the 30s and the 40s, and you know, you're you're seeing the continuing dispossession of American industry through globalization. And you go back and read uh, Vince's first book, No Smoke, which is there's no more industrial smoke, and the devastation uh, that was occurring in a shoe city um, is uh, is is brilliantly captured. And you know, the the tombstones that he wrote about in his factory town. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, in in the 30s, and the movement of uh, of industry uh, to get away from organized labor uh, to the south has is, is just been an ongoing story of uh, of domination and dispossession. And uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, he was also a member of the Communist Party. Uh, he was involved in a uh, a labor union uh, that was a uh, red-led uh, labor union, and after the um, the end of the Cold War, when uh, the alliance between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union ended, uh, there was immense pressure that was brought to bear on any of the left-leaning uh, unions uh, in American industry and. Uh, as a result, uh, Farini was uh, pretty much blasted out of the General Electric factory uh, in Lynn, Massachusetts. And you know, interestingly enough, Charles Olson, you can look at him as another kind of interesting casualty of, uh, of Cold War policy, where uh, after World War II uh, and the election of Truman, um, you know, there was a there was a wider uh, birth of uh, of social democratic, left wing, fellow traveling, uh, communist uh, inspired uh, politic, uh, ideology, uh, action uh, that was that was a part of the the American scene, and that was uh, you know strongly and vigorously uh, suppressed, and and both Farini and Olson. Uh, landed in the uh, in the universe of poetry, and uh, practically speaking, in the uh, the fishing village of uh, of Gloucester, Massachusetts, uh, and uh, and that was where they uh, they both uh, did their um, did their work, uh, which was a uh, a work that uh, you know from from two different angles uh, tried to. Uh, Retain and uh, enliven and refresh 
uh, social conscience uh, as well as uh, animating uh, life uh, through uh, through poesis and uh, you know it's uh, it's just the, t- the the two the two poets together uh, in that particular place uh, make for a really rich and interesting story on political historical. Uh, poetic, mythological, uh, archetypal levels, and uh, it's a it's a story in American literature that uh, is really unlike any other, uh, largely because it uh, it taps into so many of these uh, of these themes of these of these currents, both both in a material sense and in an imaginal sense. So you so you have this tension, you know, between uh, you know um, the the materialist. Uh, Concrete uh, ideology of uh, of Marxism and justice and political and economic systems, uh, the forces of history that uh, drive uh, uh, perhaps uh, you know deviant uh, poetic uh, poetically inspired uh, agents uh, out of the fold as uh, as the, as the as the grip of the empire becomes uh, tighter and tighter. Mm-hmm. When I was in college, Ken, I you know I studied uh, English literature in college, and Olson was talked about. I think he was sort of a tangential figure, at least at my school during the '80s. Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. Farini was not mentioned at all, and I consider myself pretty well read. And I you know I went out and I I you know searched high and low for poets that made sense to me. Meanwhile, people the influence like Robert Creeley were lauded during the time when I was in college. Why is Perini not as well respected or taught uh, in the, the, uh, within the walls of the university? Well, I think there are a couple of, uh, I think one of the reasons is that he is uh, an autodidact, uh, working class, uh, Italian American, uh, who doesn't have the formal uh, pedigrees of, uh, of, of learning. Uh, he was a, you know, he was a kind of DIY uh, Dionysian um, communist, <laughs> and uh, you know his his poetry is a kind of feeling saturated poetry that doesn't connect in any way, shape, or form with uh, uh, the kind of formalism that I think was probably a part of uh, um, some of your uh, some of your background, uh, and then even in terms of the more austere. Uh, modes of, of poetry, which is a, a more cerebral mode of poetry, when you're when you're thinking about uh, maybe some of the Black Mountain poetry that uh, that you're referencing. Uh, so Farini comes up kind of short. The uh, um, what would you say? The uh, kind of the cerebral, uh, intellectually driven uh, models of uh, of poetry, and he was also. Uh, kind of sacrificed by Charles Olson in the Maximus poems. He was scapegoated. Uh, he was uh, viciously attacked uh, in uh, in Letter Five of the Maximus poems. Uh, and much of this, I think, has to do with uh, you know style, uh, the personal equation of, a, of an emotionally drenched, kind of feeling, uh, intuitive, um, watery mode of poetry that puts a, a strong accent. On uh, on emotional experience, uh, and then there was also a kind of dilation uh, in uh, in his poetry toward a metaphysical, uh, spiritual register uh, that uh, that that Olson found uh, unpalatable. Mm-hmm. So his reputation uh, was uh, was compromised in the Maximus poems, uh, for one, and he was was held out as an example of of how not to be a poet. And even my own experience uh, with uh, with Farini uh, was was an, an engagement with a mode of poetry that uh, did not initially claim me. You know, poetry is something that, or, or like anything in the world, right? I mean, it's it's either going to claim a part of our psyche or repel a part of our psyche. And if something is repelling our psyche, then the question is, why the hell is this repelling our psyche? Yeah. And that and that was that was how I came to Farini. Uh, I came to Farini because I uh, I'm also a Capricorn like Charles Olson. Farini is a Cancerian poet, and you know they they're, they're these are two marvelous opposites uh, in great in great tension. 
Uh, so you have the, the matriarchal, uh, the lunarian, uh, with uh, with Farini, uh, partic- you know, calling for participation, and then with Olson you have uh, the Capricorn, the, 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 the Saturnian, uh, the tendency toward a kind of titanic domination or devouring uh, of the child. So there's there's some great archetypal tensions that I needed to uh, come to terms with in my my own ability to uh, to read and uh, and interpret and respond. Uh, to text, but in short, that's I, I think that that that's kind of the long answer uh, to mm-hmm. your question as to why Farini is devalued, right? I mean, he's devalued just as we devalue the moon, as we devalue the lunar, as we de- devalue the maternal, and uh, and and Farini uh, completely um, presents uh, those values in his work, you know, in all their uh, in all their luster. And uh, and in all their slop. Yeah, I, you know I'm not entirely familiar again with his with his poetry, so I'm not I'm not I'm not sure what the frame of references are. Maybe you can clarify this. How much of his poetry has to do with locale and personal history that he references? Uh, I would say that uh, mm, I would say that 90% of it has to do with. Uh, I mean, in, in, ostensibly, uh, his his work is divided into the two cities that he that he lived in. One was the city of Lynn, which was involved with shoemaking, and right. then then he was still living in Lynn, and then working in the General Electric plant in Lynn. So that was the phase when he was a proletarian poet. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then he moved to Gloucester, and there was a shift, and he shifted into a more mystical register. Uh, at that point, he began. Uh, uh, well, he was out of indu- you know he shifted out of industrial work, uh, and uh, and he started to uh, move into a more uh, interior, uh, spiritually inclined uh, mode of poetry. That uh, also that, that still worked its way into uh, a local a local activism and a local engagement with uh, with personalities with uh, with Gloucester City Hall, uh, with the struggle to uh, retain uh, economic justice and integrity for uh, for fishermen. You know battles against uh, economic development, uh, which uh, you know which which Charles Olson was also involved in in their place. So there is a there, there is a very kind of strong local grain uh, to uh, to Farini's work, and, and in, in, a, in a certain sense, uh, he's a herald of that uh, of that new localism, right? And uh, just as Olson was, right. uh, you know, the the poet uh, embedded uh, in both the uh, the nature and the culture and the politics of the place. So the two yeah. cities are are kind of. Uh, the, the topos of, uh, of of his work. The, the reason I asked you that is because I, you know I when I was in college, uh, the uh, the new criticism, you know, was was the new school of criticism coming out of Chicago was really popular. And, it, and and basically what it was is look at the poem as the poem as a tremendously still poem of event, and that there wasn't really any kind of encouragement. To understand the history, the locale, anything that would have contributed to that poem, which I thought was in um, sociopathic in some ways. In terms of well, yeah, yeah, how to um, yeah. The um, I mean, that's that's the well wrought urn, right? I mean, that's kind of the uh, it's the you know it's it's really the it's the scrubbing, right? Of yeah. uh, of of personal psychological historical factors to create uh, a very uh, rarefied uh, object that uh, that becomes the specimen of uh, of professional study a kind of butterfly under glass right and to me that that whole school of criticism contributed to the, to, to the language poetry movement which sounded great but I'm not I'm ever sure what that was about you know I mean I I like the poets, but what were they really talking about? I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm making too many critical leaps here. But I just, no, no, I, no, no. That I mean, that I, you're there. It's really not a leap at all because uh, you're in a, in a, what you're fingering is you're fingering uh, formalism, right? You're you're fingering 
uh, you're fingering a, uh, a, 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 a an inclination that uh, that really has uh, kind of supported the uh, the professional <laughs> the professional development of a of a particular mode of uh, a, a particular mode of poetry, and uh, it's. It's a combination of, uh, of of theory, right, which is a, a head-bound kind of thing, uh, and uh, and uh, an accent on language, which is in this particular mode equated with uh, with the unconscious. But the the agency of the of the poet is uh, is really kind of left uh, in the dark or in the shadow, and. Yeah. Uh, um there i i'm interested in the poetry uh traditions that were kind of run over by that juggernaut and uh i think uh and and i mean there, it's all i mean all po- all poetry and all culture is you know is part of a whole right so there's i mean there's always a, a certain complex uh that that provides an opportunity uh for a a reader to uh to scrutinize what aspect of their uh, of their own psyche uh, is being claimed or repelled by whatever is being uh, presented, but uh, the contradictions of uh, of language poetry, uh, you know, troubled me initially. Uh, you know, simply on the basis of the way it was representing, uh, you know, its relationship to property and uh, and uh, and the commodity. Uh, right. so, so, so that those those con- those contradictions uh, were, uh, you know, just from a normal uh, a normalizing uh, way of uh, of reading. I, I didn't find that they had a great deal of uh, of credibility or of veracity from you know from 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 what I could see. Well, there was no blood either. I felt I mean, absolutely funny. no blood, no body, no emotion, no author. I mean, these these yeah. were. Uh, that that was the movement that that comes. Uh, that's you know all you have is uh, that's that's uh, after the death of the author, right? That was the uh, that was the period in which they were writing, and the subject, uh, the subject position uh, within the poetry was completely devalued and uh, and discredited. But you know, but meanwhile, I mean, there, you still have an agent that's obviously pimping their work, you know, and putting it out there for for some purpose. Right, uh, and that's and that's and that's the fray, and that's the melee of the psyche where uh, I'm most interested, because that's where you know that's where it all kind of comes together. Uh, it doesn't come together in the well wrought urn for me, or yeah. if that makes sense to your it experience. Does, it does make sense, and, and, and you know, when I, at that time, you know, I was young, I'm exploring and trying to figure out you know, the world through poetry, and here we're given this kind of codex to just look at the poem and not try to understand context or the history or any of that stuff. And then you come across something like the Cantos by Pound, which are complete nonsense when you look at it through that mirror. You know, but if you understand Pound, you understand history, his own personal history, then all of a sudden the Cantos become something very different. It yeah. forces you to look at Pound, it forces you with all of his glories and all of his warts and everything, and all of a sudden the canvas become this kind of spellbinding sort of uh, un- unfurling of this guy's, you know, sanity and insanity yeah, uh, yeah. in the midst of the 20th century. Now you get a clearer picture of it. When you yeah. look at it through the new, cr- the new criticism lens, the new school criticism, it's just madness, and it's, and it's not. And, that, and that's where I think, you know, we tend to – there's something that was really integral – that was being transferred or transferred out of our experience of the 20th century when this new type of thinking came on board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was again. It, it's part of the, the dehumanizing process, I think. Exactly. Absolutely. And it's, it's the loss of. I mean, really. I mean, in short, I you know you can call it the the loss of soul, the surrender of soul, uh, which is really you know the surrender of source. Uh, the surrender of our personal, the integrity of our personal experience of Mother Nature, right? The yeah. integrity of our relationship, you know. And this is really, in a, in a certain sense, it's a, a loss of, uh, of 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 maternal Cancerian capacity, right? That's it's right. The loss of it's the loss of our own, uh, you know, watery Luna. <laughs> it's the loss of access to a relationship of uh, of ourselves to uh, to the unconscious and our capacity to participate 
uh, in that uh, in that rich in the riches of that uh, of that world in both a psychic and uh, in a psychic sense and in a sense of uh, of body as well. Yeah, that was that was done away with, and I and I, and I think that you know in that sense the poetry reflects uh, the society and the civilization yeah. and uh, the diseases of the society and the civilization. Yeah. There's a dehydration and a desiccation that comes along. Yeah, with. that's good. That's good. A dehydration is uh, that's absolutely on the money. Yeah. And, I mean, and so the Farini comes in. I mean, Farini comes in as a water source. Right. Right. You know. And, uh, please, you know. That, that's that's his. That's that's what he. That's what he delivers. You know. And I mean, you can be flooded in a water source. You know, and there could be damage done in water. I mean, the, the point is, you know, you've got to try to work. Uh, Work the elements in a in a way that is uh, that is creative and, and and recognize the the use and the value of each element uh, that a poet brings to the wider concourse of, uh, of 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 poetry and of that poetic account uh, in the world and uh, and the necessity for a rich context in order to uh, in order to read the poem in that. Uh, in that field, as, as a social field, as an archetypal field, as a field of soul, uh, all of those dimensions have to uh, have to be considered and honored. Yes, I totally agree. Did you did you bring a Farini poem that you wanted to reference or? Uh, yeah, I, I've got uh, I've got one here. Um, let's see. You know, I'm going to read one that's uh, called Forge Plant. Uh, this would be. Uh, a poem that was uh, written in the in the late forties, I believe, uh, when he was working in the General Electric factory, and this this will kind of give you a sense of uh, of where he was coming from in the forties. Okay. Forge plant, insects with antlers and iron shoes, their eyes peer out of asbestos boxes, pushing two-ton stock, red as sunrise, out of yellow volcanoes of furnaces to be cut and shaped by nine-ton electric hammers, black workers, white workers, looking alike with dirt and oil, and the women in amber rooms polishing, cutting, filing, and the fussy jobs of grinders at the edge of the storm. Look how they feed the hot metal into mighty intestines, pounding them into molds in a shower of stars, needing thunder and lightning and the strength and secrets of the universe. Like gods at the bins of forges, wetting the bird feet with swab by the trigger thud, 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 thud. Oh, workers, nothing is impossible for you. Pounders of the tongues of ships, the gusts of holocaust. Unconscious, O oh, workers of your genius. And now wielding your power and grasp like giants. Energies paid by war. Why have you never worked like this in peacetime? Wow. That's the poem. There's but you some... can you can you can hear that ferocious force, right? That industrial strength uh cry uh for for peace uh from an industrial worker that was working in a time of uh of war, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful stuff. That's really yeah, so, so that's a that's a that's a very you know that's a very powerful uh, a powerful industrial poem, and you know then he then he started to move into a, a much uh, a much different. Uh, and, I mean, there there there's such a range of his poetry. Uh, there are poems that he wrote in a kind of uh, Italian uh, English uh, vernacular uh, that uh, that are that are kind of orally uh, driven. Uh, poems. There are, there are metaphysical poems. There are many poems of letters uh, that he's uh, that he's written. Uh, he would wrote, write regularly uh, letters to the editor to the Gloucester Times, and uh, he's a great prose writer. And uh, I would uh, I, I would I really think that the autobiography of Vincent Farini, Hermit of the Clouds, is uh, is one of the great um, autobiographies of poets in uh, you know in in, in America. Um, and that's a great that's a great book too. Well, in, in a time where we theoretically celebrate uh, the the birth the the documented birth of this country, it's great to be able to talk about one of its unheralded 
superhero. So thanks for coming on, Ken. I really appreciate it. Okay, Robert. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, and let's get you back on again sometime in the proper context. Cause it's always uh, terrific to get on a mind jam with you. Uh, it's Ken Warren. He's the uh, he's the author of Captain Poetry's Sucker Punch: A Guide to the Homeric Punk Hole, 1980-2012. You can get that on Amazon, and it is a, it's a great head brush and a hypercritical read. So thanks again, Ken, and have a great day, okay? Thank you, Robert. Goodbye. All right, take care. And with that, we come to the end of a wonderful two hours. How eclectic and diverse has this show been today? We started off with Sarah Nash staring down the demons of nicotine addiction, shaking them out. Forever, we pray and hope. And then we uh, transition to an amazing talk with Shauna Holm and her relationship with entheogens and plant medicine and love. And again, dealing with the shadow. And then really 40 terrific minutes of uh, hypercritical, poetic discourse with Ken Warren, a buddy from upstate New York. And uh, I think, no, Ken is in Ohio. I think he's in Ohio, not New York. But anyway, in the life of uh, Vincent Farini, and a wonderful poem there, and a reading by Ken. Okay, well, that's it. This is Robert Phoenix. You've been listening to Navigating the – no, you've been listening to Friday Podcast. And if you like this show, if you enjoy the content, if you are listening uh, in a podcast or you are picking this up on YouTube as a rebroadcast and you'd like to contribute to more shows like this happening, you can go to my website, robertphoenix.com. I've got a donate button on the upper left. You can throw a little money in the kitty. It goes a long ways for my cat's food, uh, which I have to get some more of at some point as my cat is sitting here on my lap now, aggressively trying to get my attention. Uh, but you can do that, and you can also read about astrology and other things on my website as well and get astrological readings. It's a three-for-one stop. What, what do you know? Monday we'll be back with the mashup. And I'm sure by the time Monday rolls around, there'll be plenty to talk about. Well, I, I'm, I suppose we could talk about Edward Snowden, the proposal from the Russian spy to be Edward Snowden's wife. That's pretty weird. We could also talk about, I'm sure, the stories now coming out of Egypt, <coughs> excuse me, about the uh, Egyptian army uh, starting to kill uh, pro Morsi supporters, not good, coming out of Egypt. Very unstable situation there, but it is what it is, and they'll figure it out. So that's it. We'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. Use your head to discern what's real, your heart to what's possible. Again, many thanks to Sarah Nash, Shauna Holm, and Kenneth Warren. We'll see you on Monday. We are living in a computer-programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this. Such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.